Well, Andrea got me lamb for Father's Day so I can have lamb shish kebab. And my daughter in New York sent me gourmet cookies. So I'm doing real good. <laughs> I'm doing real good so far. We'll see if the boys come through with anything. <laughs> I'm not waiting. I'm not holding my breath on that. So anyway, we're... We're happy for many that are not here because of Father's Day, but we're thankful for them and for their time with their families. I'd like you to turn with me to Luke chapter 9, and we've been in this chapter for several months as we go through the Gospel of Luke. If you're new with us, we do verse by verse here. And... uh, We've been in chapter 9 for quite a while. Wonderful chapter as the Lord announces his death on the cross explicitly. He'd hinted at it before, but as the Galilean ministry closes, uh, and as a failure, humanly speaking, because nobody repents, our Lord explicitly announced he's going to the cross and didn't go over very well with the 12. It went over like a concrete cloud. They didn't want to hear that. In fact, they couldn't hear it. They just had other ideas that kept them from hearing the word of God. And you see that in verse 44. And we've already been there and gone through that uh, particular uh, section. It's one of my favorite. And so I'm going to go back and get that announcement. And then we're going to come down to our section this morning. Luke chapter 9, verse 43. And they were all astonished at the mighty power of God, but while they marveled every one at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But the, and the negatives here are just amazing. They understood not this saying, it was hidden from them, and they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. Four different <laughs> ways of saying They weren't getting it and didn't want to get it, although it was very plain. Then there arose a reasoning among them, or an argument, depending on which version you're using, or dispute. Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be the greatest. This is where we are this morning. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him, and said to them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receives me, and whosoever shall receive me receives him that sent me, for he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. And then there's two other things that happen that are really very much related to this, but we're going to look at that in further Sundays down the road. Father, help me to speak in each of us to hear, and may you use your word to minister to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Kind of an appropriate illustration for Father's Day. All of us have heard on the playground when we were young things like this. My father can whip your father. My father's richer than your father. My father's smarter than your father. And on and on and on. That's third grade playground banter. And basically behind that is something quite childish. I'm better than you because my father's better than your dad. (laughs) Here we see grown men. Grown men who have been with Jesus daily for two years or one year from the cross. Our Lord now is going to end the Galilean ministry and turn south. He's going to set his face for Jerusalem. And it's because of the, everybody's marvel and everybody's astonished, but nobody's repenting. Or very few. And here we see grown men arguing with each other as to who among them are the greater. 
quite a shock, really. Grown men, petty argument, right after these marvelous events of the transfiguration that we spent several weeks on and all the other stuff at the bottom when he cast the demon out, and they're doing this. It's not just friendly banner either, it's an argument. And the text doesn't say who started it or doesn't give the details about it. Um, I have a guess it might have been the three against the nine or the nine against the three if you go back to the transfiguration and all that. But that's just a guess. I can hear the three saying, we've never blown it like you did. Nine of you couldn't cast that demon out. Maybe that started. And the nine might say, well, at least we were working, you're up there sleeping. <laughs> Who knows? We don't know. It's all conjecture. But either way, this could not have been more ill-timed. This could not have been more inappropriate. To have this kind of thing going on right after this ama amazing announcement. And... It had to break the heart of Jesus, although I know he knew it. You know, Jesus already said that John the Baptist, who'd recently been martyred, was the greatest born among women. And Jesus was greater than John. And he's going to the cross. And so, here they get into this kind of thing. And I just have to mention, you might think this was just a friendly thing and it passed, that would have been bad enough. But look with me right after the Lord's Supper one year later and the night before Jesus died. Hold your place in Luke 9 and turn with me to Luke 22. Luke 22, 24. Luke 22, 24. This is right after Jesus has said, one of you is going to betray me. And um, all of that. In verse 24, there was strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors but ye shall not be so. I preach this at pastor's conferences. God's, Jesus got a completely different idea of leadership. And if pastors don't get into his idea and have their worldly idea, it's a disaster. It shall not be so, but he that's greatest among you, let him be the, as the younger, and he that's chief as he that doth serve. For which is greater, he that dines or he that serves? is not he that dines, but I am among you as he that serves. And I'm not going to turn to it, but if we go to Matthew chapter 20, James and John got their mother, they put their mother up to ask Jesus if they could sit on the right hand or the left. What's that? It's the same thing, right? And so, Jesus was teaching, but they weren't receiving. And that should shock us because maybe we can hear things and know things that Jesus says, and we could even repeat them, but not get them. Charles Spurgeon was hated. It's, it's hard for us to accept that because he's such a great preacher, and we think, how could anybody hate Spurgeon? He was. He was vilified in the newspapers. People said he wasn't even born again. and All kinds of stuff you just can't imagine. And somebody, somebody was ragging on him in the, news, in the newspaper, and, in the, and they said, he's a great humbug. And Spurgeon said, I didn't know I was a great anything. <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> 
But what a shabby immaturity the 12 display here. It, it, it was, I'm sure I gave similar things to my seminary professors and to the pastor that trained me and probably still do to those that know me. But it's still kind of hard to see it in the apostles, isn't it? Shabby immaturity after two whole years with Jesus. And we'll see worse things next because this whole call down fire and burn them up and you know, all that, that's all part of what's coming out of this same thing. All of us who are older remember the Mickey Mouse Club. Who's the leader of the club that's made for you and me? And they spell it out, and then it's Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. Remember that? That's what I kind of picture in this argument between the apostles and I wonder who started that. Who got that started? That, who took the conversation from Jesus going to the cross in this direction? I, I don't think churches after the service should put on, on spiritual talk or religious talk at all. But I know we can, through taking things in a wrong direction, we can kill a good sermon. I can do it, and I've done it. I just killed my own sermon by being whatever. And that's kind of what I see here when things take this very bad reaction. And I think God help us to be edifying. Let all things be done to edifying. We only have few moments with each other a week. We need to kind of work on that. doesn't mean we got to always quote Bible verses or try to be spiritual, but we want to try to be edifying. Over four decades ago, this was over four decades ago because I was in a different church and in a, in a different position. I've been here 45 years, so it was a long time ago. I was at a pastor's conference, and there was probably about 30 pastors there, none of whom I knew. I was a young guy then. And I'm sit, I, I, I didn't know anybody there, and I'm sitting down at a table, and uh, some pastor at the table here, after I got introduced, he introduces this into the congregation. Well, so-and-so's Dr. So-and-so, and so-and-so's Dr. So-and-so, and so-and-so's Dr. So-and-so, and I'm just pastor. And he was upset. Everybody else got to be called doctor. And I wanted to pick my plate up and leave. <laughs> I was pretty upset. I thought, I came all, I drove all the way to this pastor conference, conference to hear that? <laughs> Is that the kind of people that come here? And maybe he was trying to be funny. I don't know. I don't, I, <laughs> but I didn't, it didn't take me, I took, maybe I took him in the wrong way, but he kind of killed the day for me. And I remember in, in seminary, there was a young man that later transferred for another seminary and dropped out. But I remember praying with him one time. I got assigned to pray with him. He's on his knees saying, God, make me great for you. There was something about that that struck me the wrong way. It didn't seem quite appropriate. And I was tempted to think, there's no hope for people like that. In fact, at the time, I think, this guy's worthless. I can't, I can't do anything with this guy. Nobody can. And when he dropped out, I thought, nah, don't I? But you know, how about the 12? If you hear them doing this, you'd think, they're hopeless. <laughs> they're just hopeless. But when you look at them 30 years later, boy, a, lot, a big difference, right? So God help us to be patient <laughs> as the Lord is. But here, promoting self is the exact total 180 degree opposite of denying yourself. Take up your cross, follow me, take up your cross daily and follow me. And so may God help us to hear what Jesus says. And it's quite important to hear it. Turn with me to Two alter, alternate accounts of this in Mark chapter 9. We have three accounts of this in the Synoptic Gospels. And each one gives us a little something, the other one doesn't. Mark.
Mark chapter 9. And this is not in Luke. Luke leaves this out on purpose. He's got a reason. And they're coming down from the mountain. And they, they get the, the announcement and all of that. And about the, they've come down from the mountain. The demon's cast out. And Jesus announces the cross. In verse 32, they understood not that saying. 9.32, and were afraid to ask. This is the first inspired account of this event. And they came to Capernaum. Now Luke leaves that out. He's not interested in this. Everybody knows this story already. And being in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the way? And they held their peace. For on the way they disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. Does the Lord listen to our conversation in the car? Yes. <laughs> Does he listen to our conversation while we walk along the road? Yes. Is he interested in it? Yes. So they were a little embarrassed to bring up what was being said among them. And he sat down. He's in the house in Capernaum. This, by the way, this is one of the verses that gives a clue where the Mount of Transfiguration may have been. Fairly close to Capernaum. But we're not positive of that. Nobody knows for sure. But they held their peace, for they'd been disputing among themselves who should be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and said, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. You want to be the greatest? Be a great servant. Of everybody. That's how heaven spells greatness. He took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he'd taken him in his arms, he said, must have been a small one. Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receives me. And whoever shall receive me receives not me, but him that sent me. Go to Matthew 18, which Matthew no doubt had Mark's account because Mark was written first. And Matthew also recorded some things that we don't see in Luke. Here, Jesus poses the question. And I know you know that more was said on all these occasions than we have in our Gospels, right? So each one records some of what was said in a more extended time. At the same time, the disciples, at the same time came the disciples to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So sooner or later they must have found their voice and asked, and Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them, said, Verily I say to you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever shall be humble himself as a little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receives me. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones who believe in me, it were better for them that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the sea. So there's some other accounts of the same thing. Now, Luke, it leaves some of this stuff out. Because what Luke wants to do, now I, I read that so we could come back to Luke. He is very uh, intentional here in his presentation. And I'm, I'm quoting a Lutheran scholar, Linsky, on this. He said, Luke seems to place the, this incident next to the preaching account in order to show the earthly thoughts that were in their hearts of the disciples concerning the kingdom of Jesus, which prevented them from realizing that Jesus meant just what he said. How many people have presuppositions? They have one way of looking at something, theologically, philosophically. They can't hear what's said because it has to filter through their way of thinking. And so what Linsky is saying is that all of this he leaves out some of this other stuff about Capernaum and the other things to just put this argument right up against what Jesus said uh, about his death and why they weren't hearing it. That's the picture. Philip Ryken said the, the, the dispute was foolish because, like us, none of the disciples were all that great in the first place. 
remembering they were men who could hardly stay awake at the end of the prayer meeting. Trying to find great disciples was a bit like trying to find the world's tallest pygmy. <laughs> they weren't that great at that point. And they're arguing about how great they are. Elijah was great. God made him that way. Moses was great. John the Baptist was greater than them. Jesus was greater than John. And here's the disciples arguing who's the greatest. Um, let's talk about this. Let's think about this. And let's try to apply this this morning and just look at the text and say, what can we take home with us in the way of application so we don't fall into this, uh, whether we're arguing about ourselves or even the whole idea, our church is great. Our church is better than your church. <laughs> That's what they do next. With the man was casting demons out uh, in your name and we forbid him. It was basically our group. Is, he's not in our group. He's not following us. So we forbid him. That's just on a different scale than this. And so we'll talk about that next time. There are churches better than other churches because of their, what they teach or what they don't teach, but this wasn't, the, he didn't bring it up that way. Okay, anyone who argues about something like this is engaging in self-promotion or group promotion and missing the whole follow me, deny yourself, take up daily, take up your cross and follow me. They're being more like Nebuchadnezzar. Isn't this great Babylon that I built? And if Babylon's great, I'm great because I built it. How far did that get Nebuchadnezzar? God had to cut him down to size. <laughs> If I can picture it there. How about Simon Magus in the book of Acts who, who went around telling everybody he was some great one. He was a false teacher. In fact, he was a, one of the early false teachers in the early church. It started out, he was somebody great, promoting himself. Self-promotion is a very bad thing. And they're arguing who's the greater of them. And this brings up something else. The immaturity of the most mature. I told you I was going to talk about this today. Um, I got married when I was 31. My first son was born when I was 33. The next son was born when I was 36. I think I'm right on those figures. Next was, our next daughter was born when I was 40. I thought, I'm getting too old to have kids. And then Andrew was born when I was 53. <laughs> but I remember, I remember being in my 30s, and I thought I was pretty mature. And my guess is my kids probably thought I was mature. But all of us that are a few years, a few decades past our 30s, how mature were we? We thought we were. In fact, there's people, and maybe we were some of them, that thought we were more mature than our parents. Right? How many young people in their 20s or 30s think they're more mature than their parents? And the old thing of Mark Twain, I thought my dad was the stupidest guy in the world when I was 18, and when I was 21, I was amazed how much he'd learned. <laughs> but that's an old saying attributed to him. But how many young people today and maybe we were some of them that, you know, in the 60s generation, which was mine, we thought everybody under 20, we got it, or under 30, we got it under control. Nobody else knows anything. We're the greatest. And that probably carried over into our spiritual life, even when we were serving the Lord. We thought we knew better than other people. And no doubt our kids... Immediate, most thought, this is a mature Christian. My parents are mature. They're more mature than me. They're mature. Were we? I'm looking back and think, not so mature. <laughs> not so great. A lot of things I still needed to learn, even though I was already a pastor. The immaturity of the most mature. And I'm not talking about being so evil like the 
people in Micah, the best of them is a briar. I'm not talking about that kind of depravity. I'm simply saying being behind on our sanctification and not being all we should be as we probably still are now. So I'm not saying the apostles were as bad as the people of Micah's day. They were not. But they were well below where they would be and should be. Remember, Paul said, not that I've already attained. Philippians 3. He said that, didn't he? But I follow after. Paul, who'd been a Christian for 20-some years when he wrote that, I haven't attained yet. And same thing in Romans. When I would do good, evil's present with me. He said that as a Christian. He recognized immaturity. In fact, he said stuff like, I'm the least of the apostles. In fact, I'm the less than least of the saints. <laughs> Seemed like the older he got, the <laughs> better understanding he had of how far he needed to go to grow. And so the, the, the immaturity, the mature, is not just something that the apostles had. The op obvious thing is that you and I have probably got some of the same stuff. The best of us. I think Abraham was one of the most mature guys in the Bible. But he pulled some pretty bad moves. How about Isaac? I mean, he was so mature he thought he was going to die. <laughs> And he was still pulling some bad moves, putting Esau above Jacob. And then he had to tremble because he was on the wrong side of God's will. And so we look in the scriptures and we find the best of the best. What's the old saying? The best of men are men at best. And that's true of Christian men, too, and women. So we look at the immaturity of the mature, and it's, it's a shocking thing to see the apostles. The, only, the thing that really encourages me is, if I, let me just take Peter. You look at Peter in the Gospels, and you think, this is hopeless. Especially the Gospel of Mark or any of them that he just, he's not going to, he's not going to get anywhere. This guy's stuck. And then you look at him in 1 Peter 1 and 2 Peter, you thought, wow, is this the same man? This was 30 years later. The very things he was against, he's now for. The very th <laughs> he, he just, he'd done, done some 180s. Read the Gospels. Read about Peter. See all the things he was fighting about, arguing with. Not so, Lord, this will not be to you. Not going to the cross. Boy, was he glorying in the cross in 1 Peter and and Second Peter. He'd matured quite a bit. In fact, he was even talking about growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of his life. So we see what Jesus uh, did and said here in light of all of this immaturity. And it's, it's rather stunning what he said. It says, first Jesus did something and then he said something. It says, verse 47 of Luke 9, Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him. Apparently there was a child somewhere in the house, and he, maybe it was Peter's child, somebody said. Somebody said it might have been the boy that Jesus cast the demon out, but I think they're long gone from there. We don't know who it was, but there's a child. So he did that first. And I'll bet every one of the 12 said, now it's coming. <laughs> now it's coming. And he said to them, whoever shall receive this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. If there was ever a validation, this is a side point, no extra charge. If there was ever a validation for children's ministry, camp ministry, young people's ministry, 
nursery, Sunday school. If there was ever a validation of women's ministry to other women and children, it's this verse. Very interesting. Whoever shall receive this child in my name. Do you realize the rabbis would, many rabbis, this is awful, this is so unbiblical, but many rabbis would not waste their time talking to a woman or children. They actually thought it's unspiritual. There were rabbis that wouldn't even speak to women or children. Children are beneath us. We are Bible teachers. We are important. We talk to men about the Bible. We don't have time for children. How countercultural was this when Jesus said something like this? Striking. Amazing. The Roman world and the Jewish world love children, but they also believe they're on the bottom of the social scale. In this sense, they can't give me a hand up. How many people spend their lives looking for somebody that can lift them up in the business world or in the society? They make friends with them. They hang out with them. They do things for them. Because the whole thing is not really denying themselves. It's promoting themselves. I spend time with people that can do something for me. A little child can't do anything for you. I'm talking socially, usually, or financially. They don't have any contacts. So Jesus, uh, Joel Green said, Jesus turns the social pyramid upside down. And what's true of children is true for all kinds of people who have no connections, have no, no social importance. They can't help you financially. They can't even help you build your church because they'll never come to church. You know I've spent my life teaching in nursing homes. A lot of pastors won't do it because they'll say, you can't grow your church by nursing home ministries. And they're right. They're not coming to church. Maybe some of their family might, but mostly you're spending a lot of time with people that will never come out and put something in the plate. Or help you with a building program. But I, I believe the Lord blesses ministries that intentionally, intentionally target people that other people don't care about. I believe there's an inversion here that's important. Instead of going after the person, boy, if I win this important person in the community, we will be on a roll. I believe we should, in, we should be intentional in the way Jesus teaches here, he took that social pyramid and turned it upside down. I've spent a lot of time in my life teaching OU students, and especially Chinese students, most of whom are going to move away. And most of whom, many of whom are smarter than me. They're going to do something, but it won't be here. Well, some have stayed. Some are here this morning. But what I'm saying is, Jesus is talking about ministering to people that can't give back to you. That's really what Jesus is doing when he came down here, right? What's he get out of it? Other than thank you, Lord, for all eternity. Who are we on this ball of dirt going around this cemetery of sin that Jesus comes here to of all the places to go in the universe to come here and camp out here and to identify with us as a human, as the God-man for all eternity, never to be undone. Whosoever shall receive this child in my name or this homeless person or this whatever or this person without big social connections receives me Whoever receives me receives him that sent me. For he that's least among you all, the same shall be great. In other words, that person will be great because that person isn't trying to, trying to climb the ecclesiastical ladder of success. 
that person's trying to swim to the bottom of the pool instead of the top. That's, that's how Jesus defines greater. What does that tell us about women, men? They spend a lot of time teaching kids. I personally believe mothers are going to get ten times the reward of pastors. You may disagree with that. Sunday school teachers, anybody can teach all those wiggly bodies and, and put up with that and do that. They, they got something coming. Camp counselors that some of the rest of us who maybe have the more prominent ministries that some people think are important, we're going to be way behind. Women got nothing to complain about. God's portion to them. Anybody ought to be complaining about BS. <laughs> That's men. Well, anyway. Um... Turn with me to Matthew 25. I, I don't have too long here yet. Matthew 25. Look with me in 31. Matthew 25, 31. You know this text. I believe this is the future tribulation, but the point is still the same. Notice. Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit on the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all the nations and he'll separate them one from another as shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He'll set the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left. Then shall the king say to them on the right hand, come ye blessed of the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me food drink. I was a stranger and you took me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer and say, Lord, when? When we do that? Nothing we did was like anything like this. I didn't, didn't, I didn't come to you in prison. When do we do it? When saw we thee hungry and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? When saw we thee sick or in prison and came to thee? And the king shall answer and say, Verily I say to thee, Inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you've done it to me. Now that's not the homeless in Calcutta like Mother Teresa says. It's just not anybody out there. This is talking about believers who are proclaiming the gospel under threat of death and imprisonment, especially in the tribulation. So you've done it for them because of the message they taught. But the others, in verse 41, Then shall he say also to them on the left, Depart from me, you cursed and everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. In prison, you visited me not. And then they'll say, Lord, when saw we thee hungry or thirst or stranger or naked or sick or in prison didn't minister to you? And you'll say, verily I say, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And the whole picture is what? Sins of omission because you had no interest in the message. None. Not wasting my time and money on that. Your heart was elsewhere. So what a... It doesn't have to be the greatest of the preachers of that time. It's the least of them. So God's interested in the least, right, uh, uh, out there. May God help us to have that mindset. Advancement in the kingdom of God is by taking the low place. William Kelly, the Plymouth Brethren, said, Jesus was willing to take and did take the place of the most despicable of all. And where was that? the cross. And if we're going to take up, if we're going to follow him and take up and deny ourselves, and take, we've got to look for ways to deny ourselves. We can't deny ourselves by promoting ourselves. <laughs> this will make me important. This will get people's attention. This will, we, got, we can deny ourselves by thinking, uh, where can I do a ministry that nobody's going to know about and it's not going to come back on me in any way. I'm going for that.
the greatness Jesus is talking about is the antithesis of the greatness they were arguing about. I heard this third hand from someone who was in our church who was in a place to know. We're talking in, in our church 40 years ago. And he told me about a fellow in our church, and I remember this fellow. He had a master's in economics. He was bright, really brilliant guy, very gifted athletically. And this guy, I heard after he left, was end up on Wall Street. He spent years on Wall Street, decades on Wall Street. And I inquired about him to this other Christian who was here, who I was on the phone with. And he said, he left Wall Street after 2008. He's living in San Francisco working with homeless people. And ever since he told me that, I'm trying to get that in my head. You know, a Christian can serve the Lord in Wall Street. A Christian can serve the Lord anywhere. I wouldn't be surprised on the Bema Seat Day that that man gets bigger rewards for what he did with the homeless than what he did on Wall Street. What do you want to bet? Now, the up and outer needs the gospel as much as the down and outer. We know that. Somebody's got to do it. Thank God for the people that do it. Thank God for wealthy people, gifted people that can work with up and outers. And I'm always that. I've, I've taught Bible classes my whole life and some in really nice homes. And I'm thankful for people that have really nice homes that open it up and people come from their class or their neighborhood so they can be taught. And that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And we don't always get to choose where God puts us. And if God puts us in working with up and outers and if we are financially in good shape and socially in good shape, we use it. But we don't look at ourselves as somebody great, right? We're just servants even then. We retain that servant mindset. We retain that, I got the towel on here. But what an amazing thing that was. I was so pleased to hear that story. Another application, if Jesus could endure so much immaturity and weakness in people he poured his life in for two years so they could someday be mature. How about you and me? You ever give up on somebody? I'm serious. You ever just say, I've put enough time in on that person. I confess I have. If I didn't say it with my lips, I kind of... <laughs> I'm just going to try on somebody else. And sometimes you have to do that because someone's not. But if Jesus, I, this convicts me, if Jesus could endure so much immaturity and weakness in disciples in, who were leaders, God help us to do it. You know, sometimes it, the hardest immaturity to endure is from your pastor. Pastors are supposed to be mature people, right? 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1. But where do you get a pastor that's mature every year of his life? Is there one on this planet? Maybe. Maybe there's many. But there's also many who are works in process, right? Progress. And they need long-suffering, too. And I've appreciated the long-suffering of this church with mine. Um, God uses people who are not great. Even people that think they are and aren't. That's good, isn't it? <laughs> God likes to work with people who are not great. How about Gideon? I'm the least in my father's house. You, you got, you're knocking on the wrong door here. You need somebody with more social importance. Read it in Luke in Judges 6.15. God seems to delight 
And even people who are great, maybe they've made it in the world like Moses. God puts them in a place where they realize they're not so great. And when God called Moses of the burning bush, he said, you better get somebody else. I'm not qualified. I, I don't even know how to speak. The years before that, he was mighty in word and deed. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15, and then I better wind this down. First Corinthians 15. Have you ever uh, been embarrassed? Some immaturity has come out in front of everybody. The Lord and His providence have shown it. Well, that's what happened to the apostles. But somehow that was a step in their maturity. And Paul, who was great, he was intellectually a great individual. And socially, he was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. But because of what he did in persecuting the church, he was humbled. And he writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, I'm the least of the apostles, and I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But thank God he uses people who are the least, who've blown it, who've blown it really badly. Leah, not Rachel, became the ancestress of the Messiah. Think of that. Jacob, not Esau, became the ancestor of the Messiah. Paul said to the Corinthians, not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are what? Called. God is going after those, down, those people. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, he, even after he was saved, he needed a thorn in the flesh to do what? Keep him humble. And I besought the Lord three times, he'd take it away, and the Lord said, no, my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. I need you sick, Paul, better than well. Some sitting here had COVID, probably didn't want it. Anybody here want it? <laughs> but as you, as you, I know some of you had it because I know some of my own family had it. But having said that, you didn't want it. How many of us here want our physical afflictions? I would rather do without mine. That list is growing as I get older. I just soon be healthier and healthier and healthier and healthier until the Lord comes. But I keep seeing more doctors. I'm, you know, I've said I supported four kids when I was young and I support about five doctors when I'm old. <laughs> so it just never ends. But if God wants me well to do what I need to do, he'll make me well. If God needs me to be what? Ill or weak or sick, that's good too. And Paul said, I'll glory in my infirmities. For when I'm weak, I'm what? Strong. He learned something. I had a brother, it's now in heaven. He died at 60 last year. He was seriously mentally ill for most of his life. But he was a Christian and he took it. He accepted on one level, he didn't. Of course, he wanted to be normal, but he wasn't. But I, w I, could, I, I looked at him and how great, great kind he was, even though he had these serious issues. And I know he's got more reward coming than I'll ever have. God has a purpose for everything that happens to his children. He never afflicts unnecessarily. And we, he knows what we need. And he knows how he wants to use us. And one last thought. Let's go back to Luke. And I'm, I'm done with this. I'm sorry. I've got a little sidetracked. Back to Father's Day. Jesus said in verse 48, Whoever shall receive this child in my name receives me. Whoever shall receive me receives him that what? 
sent me. Who sent him? God the Father. Not everybody here had a good father on earth. Everybody here had a fallen father. Nobody gets a sinless father, right, in this world. But your father in heaven is the one who sent Jesus Christ. When you look at your dad's fallenness and failures and my children know mine and they're not all imaginary. Some of them are really real. You got a heavenly father that's perfect. And you have a heavenly father that's involved. The statistics say the biggest reason for rape and prison and crime and murder is people growing up without a father in their home. That's an that's a st- earthly father. A lot of earthly fathers are absent without leave. God is not. He's the prodigal father of Luke 15. And I'm not, I didn't make a mistake when I said it that way. We call it the parable of the prodigal son. You can also call it the parable of the prodigal father in that he is lavish on, in his love towards those who don't love him the way they should. He's involved. He's concerned. He's not inactive. And if someone is not saved, Jesus said in John 5, 24, you've got to believe on him who sent me. Believe on him who sent me. By believing in Christ, we believe on him who sent him. He that's seen me has seen the Father. What a wonderful God we have. And by the way, all of this in 48 connects in with all this other stuff. The in my name and the receive and not receiving. And we'll follow it up next week if we can. If you're listening to my voice and you don't yet know the Lord and maybe... Maybe you've got various reasons for that in your own mind or heart. Would you hear the text here? There's a heavenly father that loves you more than you love yourself. Who's totally interested in you more than you could ever imagine. Who's paid the highest price that could ever be paid for your sins. That he could be your heavenly father. And not just your creator. Father, we thank you for what we looked at today. We pray that you'd work in people's hearts. We know Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. But to those that received him, gave he the power or the authority to become the sons of God. May some receive him in faith today. In Jesus' name, amen.